If you have your Bible with you and would uh, care to turn with us to the uh, 32nd Psalm, the 32nd Psalm, the Psalm of David. And uh, as we said, the idea that we've had for this is the uh, phrase that kind of comes up every once in a while in the Scripture about the eye of God. And so we're going to begin with the uh, first verse. Uh, our thought will come and our remarks will come from the eighth verse. But in starting with the first verse of this 32nd Psalm, Blessed is he whose transgression is covered, and whose sin is co and whose whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me, and my moisture is turned into the drought of summer, Selah. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin, Selah. For this shall be everyone that is godly, unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto thee, for thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Selah. I will instruct thee, and I will teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. And I will guide thee with mine eye. Be ye not like unto the horse or to the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. And that concludes the entire 32nd uh, Psalm. And as we said, our thoughts will be based upon the 8th verse, uh, where I will instruct thee. This is God speaking, speaking to David, but I think we can take this as he's speaking to all of us. He's speaking to everyone who might read this, whether that it's addressed to David, it's also addressed unto us. And I will instruct thee and I will teach thee in the way in which thou shalt go. And I will guide thee with mine eye. Now, whenever that we think about God, we course go back to the scripture in the fourth chapter of the book of John where that it says that God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth so when we think about such things as the hand of the Lord uh, his ears uh, nostrils mouth eyes uh, it's not that God has those necessary attributes but sometimes they use these kind of phrases to speak about a characteristic of God, something that we may not really think about for the most part. And I think that we could safely say that this would be talking about and concerning itself, not so much that God can see, but we know that He can, but that He sees ahead of us His providential care. And whether we realize it or not, God does watch over us. He's continually looking upon us. Now we go to bed at night, we close our eyes, and God giving us mercy, we wake up in the morning. But we think about God that His eyes are upon us and upon all that's going on 24-7. And think about that. He's not missing anything. He knows what's going on at all times. He knows what's going to happen. It's all under His providential care. 
And even though, as we were discussing a little while ago, we sometimes think that, you know, it looks like it's total chaos and it's just, you know, what are we going to do? We're in a whirlpool. We can't get out of it as far as these times are concerned. But, you know, God has it all under control. And I think what we look to do is to trust Him that no matter what happens, that He has His eye upon us. Doesn't matter what we see happen in the world, but He has His eye upon us. And I believe that He is so inclined that not only He knows what's going on, directing it, but He's concerned with each and every individual. It doesn't matter today you know, what the problem might be or what the strife or the trouble or the sickness is, I believe God is concerned with us. I believe that His love is extended towards us. And so His eye is upon us, and through that today, He's, he's guiding us. We can think of it in this way that uh, there is a holy GPS or a holy compass and do keep that in mind, Sherry. A holy GPS or compass or map that God is directing us and watching over us. Yes, things may happen to us, but God's love towards us never ends. And I want, I want to say that to you, Elkton Church. God has not deserted you. And you might say, well, preacher, you've told us this before. You keep telling this. But I do it because Satan will tell you that God isn't concerned with you anymore or that he's deserted you or he doesn't care about what happens to you or what happens to the church. God has never deserted anyone in all the time that he's been dealing with with mankind now he guides us with his eye but that can be about anything that he would use to guide us and one of the ways that he guides us he guides us through his word thy word the bible says if i hid in my heart that i might not sin against thee and we find that his word is a lamp under our feet and a light unto our path. Think about it today. There's darkness all around us. People don't even know the difference between right and between wrong anymore. It's now just a gray area. With people, there's no truth, no absolute truth. My truth will be mine, but your truth can be whatever you want it to be. And we find today that people are entrenched in that kind of darkness. But His Word kind of keeps us on the path. That's His eye directing us. And I believe He's given His Word, you know, for that purpose, that we can tell the difference between daylight and between dark. And it works like a lamp. You know, whenever you used to go down into a basement, I wasn't too keen on doing this, but, you know, you didn't know exactly what was going to be down there or what you would step on. So a good flashlight or a good lantern always helped. And it made a difference because whatever was down there, you'd see it. And you would avoid either being bit or, you know, something happening to you, falling down. And that's how the God's Word is. You know, it's a light under our pathway. And, and that's why that I believe that we need to be into the Word just constantly, continually. You know, we think about a flashlight, and the life of it usually goes out after about a month. But I want you to know that this ever-ready battery doesn't go out. It's still the same. And you know, that's gratifying to me today, because today, my friend, this is the only thing that's absolute and true today. It was true back in the days of Moses. It was true back in the days of Isaiah. It was true in the days of David. And it's true in the days of Elkton Church. And so it's a light under our pathway, under our feet, a light under our path. 
In Psalms 119 and 133, and uh, you can mark on your sheet or write on it or you know, if you're so inclined, make a paper airplane out of it. I, I used to do that in class, and I soon learned that you don't do that. But at any rate, I hope that it will be a benefit for you today. It says uh, in the second verse of Scripture that we have there, Order my steps in thy word, and let not any iniquity have dominion upon me. How easy that it is. Uh, to fall into trouble whenever that we don't stay and, and keep our steps in the Word of God. He orders our steps. He guides our steps. And there are some things that He withholds from us. You know, He's never withheld any good thing from His children. You know, we find in one scripture where that it says, Jesus himself said it, said, what individual are, and I'll kind of paraphrase this, what individual are you if your son or your daughter or whoever it might be would ask of you bread and you give him a stone? Or you would ask of him a fish and you'd give him a serpent? He said, how much more? shall your heavenly Father give unto you. If you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more will God give unto you? And so one of the things that He does, He uses His Word to keep us from falling into trouble. And I want you to know one of the things that Satan does, you can read the book of Job and you can see it there. He'll try to get us to blaspheme God and he'll accuse us unto God. And I can almost see Satan as kind of like a little, you know, running over here to God and say, do you see what Paul did down there? You know, he says he's a child of God and look what he's doing down there. You know, what are we going to do about that? God says the blood already covers him. And you know, whenever that Satan hears about the blood, that's one thing that spelled his doom on the cross was that Christ crushed the head of the serpent. He's already defeated him. Or he'll get us to doubt God. Now that, that's the problem right there. He'll get us to doubt the goodness of God towards you. This has happened to me. What has God done? Job wrestled with that. And even his friends, you know, would come to him and say, you know, Job, uh, you must have sinned and done something. You know, you must, you must be guilty of something. Isn't there some sin you're guilty of, Job? And you know, you get, you get to telling somebody something like that, and pretty soon they're going to get to doubting. You know, it's like doctors will tell you that, you know, what you say to a patient can sometimes make a big difference. If you go into a patient, you know, who's, who's depending upon treatment, part of that treatment is a good bedside manner. And you, and you go into the patient and you say, oh my, uh, you know, the stats look good, but you know what, I, I just don't know if you're going to make it or not. You know, but yet you're healthy, but I don't know. I just don't know. And you know, pretty soon the blood pressure drops, the heart rate goes out of rhythm. And I know that goes along with what it says about as a man thinketh in a heart, so is he. But you know, you can, you can actually get people to the point to where they're so downcast and, and so depressed and in despair that my friend, they just feel like, what's the use? What's the use? And I want to say this from experience, please don't ever get that way. I know we sometimes can't help the thoughts that come into our mind. I know that sometimes there'll be things that'll, that'll bombard us. But you know, it's kind of like the old saying, you can't keep the birds from flying over your head. But you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. And so that, that's, you know, that's just the thing. He will, he will not allow anything to overcome except that there be a way of escape. His eye is upon you. You know, his, He's upon you. Even when you suffer the loss of an individual, God is still there. 
Jesus can sit down beside of you and weep and say, yeah, I know how you feel. I lost a friend by the name of Lazarus. Yeah, but you raised him from the dead. Well, someday Jesus is going to raise that individual from the dead. We just have to wait. We just have to depend on the Lord. So he says that uh, let not any iniquity have dominion over me. The next thing that he says is also found in the same psalm. He says that the unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Now that's not to say that you're simple, but if you don't understand something, God eventually unfolds and reveals it. There have been times whenever that I'd run across a scripture or a, a problem or, you know, trying to figure out something. And it's like, you know, I beat my head against the desk. You know, there must be a meaning to this. And, you know, you go you go to different sources and you try to find the meaning. You ask different people and nobody can really tell you what that scripture means or what what's going on here. And then one day. When God's ready for you to understand it, it just opens up and it unfolds itself. And not only does it unfold itself, but he also reveals you some other things. He also opens up other things for you. He gives light. His words give light. His, he does not want to keep his he does not want his people to be kept in ignorance of him. He wants to reveal what he is and how much that he loves you so we find that uh, his word uh, is given to us as part of that guiding eye jesus himself prayed an intercessory prayer as he was interceding for not just his disciples but for every one of us and if you read this over in the 17th chapter of the book of john and in the 17th verse he says these words and it was and he'll say in another place that not only for these, but for those that will believe through the word of those that I send out. That's you and me. But he said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. There's one thing that God will not do. He will not lie to us. He refuses to, to do something like that. But he says, sanctify them, O God, through thy truth. The word sanctify comes from a word that means you're set apart. You know, you're, you're taken over here and you're set apart for a special purpose. Every one of you has a special purpose in the sight of God and in the government of God and in his service today. It doesn't matter what he leads you to do. If that's what he leads you to do, that's your job. That's what God wants you to do. And there's scripture that goes along with that that says, whatever that you do for the Lord, do it with all your mind. Just give yourself to it. You know, David, his job was to stand out and, do, and watch the sheep. And he did it well. Because he got to where that this is my job. This is what I'm going to do. And you know, while that he was there, he would practice with a sling. Throwing rocks. Throwing rocks. Throwing rocks. And pretty soon he got to where, and I don't think they had tin cans back then, but he would, he would put a rock over here and he would see if he could hit it. Now, I would imagine David got pretty good at it. Not only that, but I believe that he built himself up. He built up physical strength. And that came in handy when a bear and a lion came after his flock. And someone will say, do you really believe David did that? That he grabbed a lion by the mane and slew him? I most certainly do. I most certainly do, don't you? I believe, my friend, that while he was doing it, while it didn't look like much, he did it with all of his might. And today, whatever God gives you to do, do it with all of your might. And you might think today, well, what I'm doing isn't that significant. Brother, it is. 
It makes a difference in the church. It contributes to the church, to the body. You bless somebody whenever that you use your talent for the good of somebody else, a brother or sister in Christ. Well, I've heard people say, well, you know, all I can do is pray. No, that's a big part of it right there. If you can pray, pray. This preacher in Great Britain by the name of Charles Spurgeon was entertaining a man that had come to write an article about him. I mean, this man was something else. He was, he was like the Billy Graham in the 18th century or 19th century. But they asked him, what, what, what's the secret of you preaching? What's the secret of your sermons? People come from all over. Why, even, even the queen wanted him to preach before her. Uh, queen Victoria wanted an audience where that he would preach and she would attend it. But you know what he did? There was an anteroom close by the pulpit. And inside that anteroom was where the people would gather either before the service, during the service, or after the service. And they would be in there praying, holding Moses' hands up as he was outside in the auditorium praying. Don't ever think today that prayer does not avail anything. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And I want to encourage you today that as this revival comes, Brethren, don't wait till the day before to pray. Don't wait until that afternoon or when Brother Massey walks through the door. Be praying now. Be praying now. And I want you to know that God hears and He answers prayer. So sanctify them through Thy truth. Thy Word is truth. Now He guides by His Holy Spirit. You know, sometimes you'll see in the Scriptures and there's nothing, nothing bad in it describing the Holy Spirit. But sometimes they'll refer to the Holy Spirit like it or like it's a battery with a spark coming out of it. And it is, He is powerful. There is no doubt. He can do great and mighty things and the Holy Spirit does great and mighty things. But whenever that you feel the Holy Spirit in a service, or maybe you're at home, or wherever that it might be, I want you to know that's the presence of God dwelling inside of you. When He saves a soul, my friend, He takes up His residence within. He does. The body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Did you know that today? He's dwelling in you. Well, I don't know because I just don't feel Him and this and that and the other. You've been saved. He's there. Whether that you feel Him or not, it's just you've kind of got to take the, take the globe, the light globe, and kind of clean it off. Get the smoke out of it. And you put it back in its stand. And boy, will it glow. Will it glow. So anyway, he, uh, he guides by His Holy Spirit. And in the same chapter that we mentioned, or same book, the book of John, He says, I will pray the Father. That's Jesus speaking. I'll pray the Father, and He shall give you another comforter. Now, that word comforter um, comes from a word that, that describes somebody who comes in alongside to help somebody. Now, I've had people ask me to do, you know, clean up jobs and mow the lawn and everything. And, you know, I didn't exactly, and I'll admit it, didn't exactly walk in beside to help them usually. I was over under a tree with a Pepsi. But nevertheless, the Holy Spirit comes in beside us to help us, to guide us, to lead us. Not only does He dwell within us, but also He works through us and works in us. Now, one of the things that He does, He makes intercession 
unto God's throne on our behalf. Have you ever prayed and it was like, Lord, I can't even begin to express what's on my heart. I can't even begin to bring before you what I need to bring before you. But the Holy Spirit will intercede with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, I don't want to get into gifts of the Spirit and those sorts of things, but what I see in this is that when you get to that place to where that you can't even begin to express, God knows through His Holy Spirit. He's interceding. He's interceding. He's mediating. When I was saved, that's what He told me He was doing for me. I'm your mediator. I'm your intercessor. I am your advocate. As a 17-year-old boy, I didn't even know what those things were. You know, I just kind of heard them, but it didn't mean anything to me until that Christ revealed Himself to me as high priest that He was mediating on, behalf, on my behalf before God. And I'm so thankful today that He does that for everybody today. He intercedes for us. And it says that He also will abide with you forever. His eye is on you in such a way today that he, he abides with you. He guides you. He directs you. And it's not like that He comes and visits and, Hey, Paul, you home? No. He's there all the time. He's eternal as God is eternal. He has every attribute that God has. He's there forevermore. And He doesn't just go away if you happen to stumble and fall or if you happen to sin. That's another thing. He says, if we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus. And God's eye is upon us in such a way that if we do sin, Christ advocates for us. He stands up in the courtroom and says, I took the blame for him. Yes, he sinned, but Father, forgive him for my sake for these two spike, spike uh, marks in my hand. And I want you to realize today God does not take away from a person. Will not take away from person that privilege and that honor and that opportunity and he's the spirit of truth which the world cannot receive because it seeth him not and it knoweth him not but ye know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you he's the spirit of truth Every one of us understand and, and fellowship in this. And, you know, some, sometimes whenever that you get together uh, in a service or maybe when we have a dinner or whatever the case might be, and you cannot explain it, but you feel a close kinship to one another. Even though we're not related to each other that I know of, and our family tree probably wouldn't coincide. But there's a closeness. There's a, there's a brotherly, sisterly closeness with us today. The Holy Spirit does that. And the world can't give you that. Because what the world gives you is what the world gave unto the young man that left his father's house and went out and lived in the world and eventually uh, wound up uh, feeding swine which was against you know their covenant as soon as his as soon as his livelihood was over with they all deserted him but he has said I'll never leave you nor forsake you and I love that that works in each and every one of us if one of us is in trouble we all share in it if one of us has a heartache we all pray about it if one of us has a concern or has a loss, it's a loss to us. Why? Because we're related. We're related through the blood of Christ. The, Christ, the blood of Christ flows in our spiritual veins. And we're kindred. We're kindred one of another. 
Nehemiah 9 and 20 says uh, that you gave your good spirit to instruct them. You know, he instructed, Nehemiah instructed them in that day and in that time, and we received the same instruction. We sometimes have to be reminded, don't we, whenever that... Uh, we are in the world and whenever that we see this and rub shoulders in the world, sometimes we have to be reminded, you know, that's not a part of what I am. That's not what I am. And we, we are instructed in it. He'll teach us all things that I have said unto you and he'll bring them to your remembrance. Have you ever read some scripture and you think that it didn't go into your heart and you think it didn't go into your mind and then you're sitting in Sunday school or you're sitting in a church service and then something is said that will trigger that scripture. It's amazing what God does. He'll bring it to your remembrance. The Holy Spirit does. He doesn't just save us and set us on the shelf, but He saves us, and that's part of His eye that's guiding us, that's leading us today. We find that the Bible tells us that whatever is coming, whatever is happening, whatever is going to happen in these last days, and I do believe that we're living in the last days, that... The Bible tells us in the 8th chapter, in the 28th verse of the book of Romans, it says, For all things work together for good to those who love God and are the called according to His purpose. That has gone with many a saint. It went with Paul. It went with Timothy. It's gone with all of us today. God is guiding us with His eye and His love to every one of us does not fail. We've got that same capability of loving one another and loving the world even in spite of themselves. That love is called a special type of love. You know, it's never really been defined fully. The way that the writers wrote about it, that love, that eye of God, His love, that we have the capability within us, that kind of love is hard to describe. To love somebody that we would think doesn't deserve our love, but yet God puts a love in our heart for them. People that are destitute, people that are in sin, people that are in darkness, people that will probably call us every name under the sun. God puts a concern. You know, you know we can't look and listen to what comes out of their mouth. You've almost got to look, and this is not original with me, if you look into their eyes, those are the windows of the soul. Those are the windows of the soul. And when you think about that, you look at them and you think, you know, they've got a soul that God loves. They've got a soul that's going to spend eternity somewhere. And oh Lord, don't let me get mad at them. Don't let me in anger say something to them. Help me, oh God, help me to pray for them. We can have that same mind, the mind of Christ. You know, the Bible says in one place where the Christ met a young man that said, what must I do to have eternal life? And the young and Christ said, keep the law. Do not, uh, do not sin. Do not do this. Do not do that. And the young man said, I've kept all of these from my youth up. What else is there? And there's a scripture verse over in Luke that just amazes me. Christ looking upon him, it says he loved him because he knew that maybe in a way he was close in one respect, but in another way he was this far away from God. That's how the world is. Do you know the people that are lost that pass by, they might look at the church. Isn't it something 
And kind of tragic to think that when they look, that may be as close as they'll ever get to heaven. It's kind of sad. And it's kind of disconcerting. You know, from what I understand of what the Scripture teaches about it, you wouldn't want anybody to go there. But God can give us the eyes that we can look towards people in a very special way. And there's a, there's a prayer, there's a, a um, saying, and I'm not going to be able to quote it quite the way that this individual quoted it. But this individual said, Lord, give me your eyes. Give me your eye. And let me see through your eyes as you see people. Let me see them. Let me do for them what you would do. You know, I, uh, I'm going to close here in just a second, but, you know, there was a uh, combat physician that told the story about what it would be like to treat somebody who was wounded on the battlefield. And the question was posed to him, did you ever have to treat the enemy? And he said, yeah. Well, did you ever feel like that you wanted to do something to them? And he said, no. He said, I had to train myself to look at that enemy soldier that I was treating as somebody who needs my help, who's probably somebody's son back in a foreign land. And he said, how can I do to him something like that when he's in a helpless position? Why would I do it? He said, I look at him as I look at other patients that I have. I've got to do everything that I can to save that individual. You know, we're going we're gonna to close that, you know, we look with th at things with the eyes of God. And it's hard to do. It's very hard to do. But you know, I believe with God's grace, we can. And I believe that in these latter days in which that we live, you may be the only gospel that they'll ever hear and the only gospel that they'll ever witness. And I pray that God gives you the grace that no matter what the circumstances are in dealing with others, no matter what may uh, come out of their mouth or what they may say or do or look like, that somehow God will give you the grace to have His eyes and to look towards them as God would look towards them. And may God use your eyes and use your compassion and your love towards Him. And I realize today that almost borders on the social gospel that's preached in the world. But, you know, my mom used to say to me, what, do you, what on earth are you doing, Paul Lindley, for heaven's sake? What are you doing on earth for heaven's sake? I never will forget that. And that's always stuck with me.